awesome. We get to finish out this series today. And then next week, my pastor Rick Godwin will be here with us. It's 25th anniversary, one service at 10 o'clock. The doors will open at 9.30. The doors will not open until 9.30 as we get stuff set up. But you need to get here early to get a seat. We're going to pack out this room. We won't be doing social distancing in this room. But in the auditorium next door, the chairs will be set up, six-foot social distancing. And uh, so please come. He's my pastor, and he's been our pastor for 25 years as we started this church. And I really would love to see this house packed so that we can honor him. And as you always do, you bring a very special love gift. And it's going to be a fun day. We're going to feed you here, and uh, we got a lot of fun activities. So next week, be on time, 10 o'clock. Be early, yeah. Be on time is late. Early is on time. We're going to finish this series today. You have your Bible with you? If so, let's hold it up. Your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, your eyeballs, whatever you do to read the Word. Let's say it together. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the Word. I confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am obedient, and I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been in this series, and today is the third week, and we said it's been based off of a book by Warren Wiersbe, and it's called The Strategy of Satan, and I would really encourage you to get it. It's a very small little book, and it'll really help you. Uh, Another great author who is a fictional author that has a lot to do to help people understand about spiritual warfare and Satan and his army is uh, Frank Peretti. Uh, This Present Darkness. How many of you have read This Present Darkness? Great, look at all of this. And then also the second book, Piercing the Darkness. I'd really encourage you to read that. It's a fictional story, okay? But it'll help you to understand what we're talking about in spiritual warfare. So, Three weeks ago, we said that the devil is a deceiver. Last week, we looked at the devil is an accuser. And this week, we're going to finalize this by talking about the devil is a destroyer. John 10 and 10. Would you read this out loud with me? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that they may have life and that they have it more abundantly. Today, I'm going to talk about Satan and his army. I'm going to talk about uh, the demonic influence of the enemy in this world that we're living in today. There is one devil, but there are many demons. The devil can't be everywhere at the same time. He doesn't have the same attributes as God, but he has demons that are all over the place. And a few weeks ago, we looked at that, and we said one-third of the angels in heaven rebelled against God with Lucifer, and now we call them demons, right? They're unclean spirits, and they're in the atmosphere. Some of you brought a host of them with you today. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And two-thirds didn't compromise, and we're believing that two-thirds always beats one-third, even with new math, right? (laughs) Amen, amen. So somebody might ask me, well, do you guys believe in demons? Uh, Yes. The answer is absolutely yes. I've traveled in 75 different nations of the world, and many of those places I've been in are places where there's no electricity, where I, when I traveled years ago, a lot of witch doctors, a lot of things, some of the stuff I will not tell you what I've seen with my own eyes because you would think I was crazy, and it would scare the bejesus out of you, so I'm not going to talk about that today, but I will give you one experience because I want you to know, and people say, well, why, are there more, why is it more like that? Well, because most, a lot of those places have so far gone away from God or never met God, and it's so active. But listen, mark my words. As America moves farther and farther and farther away from one nation under God, you get ready. We're going to be experiencing more demonic power than we've ever experienced before. And some of you experience it, and you just never recognized it. But there's nothing to fear, because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? Amen, amen. So, as I talk about this today, sometimes people get uncomfortable. Uncomfortable when you talk about Satan as demons. But a person can't read the Bible as the Word of God without accepting the reality of demonic forces. 
Think about this. When you read the New Testament, a majority of Jesus' ministry was confronting demon powers and releasing people from the control of those demons. So here, listen to me. If we deny that demons exist, we discredit Jesus and the good news that he brings. And not only that, but he said, one of the signs that you will know of my earthly kingdom, that I'm setting up a spiritual kingdom, is that you'll overthrow demonic powers, right? I give you power to cast out devils. He says that. So that's not something that's passed away. If we still see healing power, we believe this also. Ephesians 6, 11, and 12 says, put on God's complete set of armor provided for us, that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. So he assumes that we're all going to be fighting against the enemy, that we're not just going to lay back and say, well, whatever happens will happen. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. To get a broad overview of what demons do and the power of them, I'd like for us to go to a very familiar story in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, if you'll turn there with me. And this is Jesus uh, uh, coming to the other side of the sea. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 2. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed with an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. Where had he been? In the tombs among dead people. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. He had supernatural strength. Whenever he was put in chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist, smashed the shackles, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Now here's a regular guy that was born, lived a regular life, but somewhere along the line, he began allowing the enemy. Remember I said this, this teaching is the devil made me do it, but the devil can't make you do anything. But you can open the door to him. And through those things, you give him right to not only give you feelings, but as you continue in that, then to begin to do things with you. But I want you, to, I want you to look at this. This is a man that said he has a legion of angels, a legion of demons, which could be thousands. But even in the midst of that, when he saw Jesus, he still had the ability to run to Jesus. So don't tell me that a person that is demonized can't have the ability to come to Jesus. He is still here. So it says that he's possessed with an evil spirit. Other translations said he was a man with an unclean spirit. Others say he was, had a demon. Really, the best Greek word that we could use is demonized. Demonized. Because when we think of demon possession, people think of the devil says, move left, move left. The devil says, move your foot, move my foot. And so they think of that devil possession. Demonized could be at different levels of oppression, depression, ideas. You yield to those and to the place that over a period of time, if you continually give him place, then he can begin to control parts of your life, but he can never keep you away from Jesus. Now look at this, verse 5. Day and night, he wandered. Day and night, so he's not sleeping. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. 2,000 years later. Have you listened to some of today's music? No words, but some good howling. And we're living in a world today in which people are cutting themselves, trying to hurt them, because remember, Satan is a destroyer. Verse 6 and 7, when Jesus was still some distance away, look at that, the man saw him, ran to meet him, bowed low before him, and with a shriek he screamed, why are you interfere, interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Verse 8, 
For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Now, I would encourage you to read the rest of the story. It's a great story to read. Uh, the, the, the demons, more than one, began to try to negotiate with Jesus. Please don't send us into the abyss. Don't send us away from this region where we are already principalities and powers over this region. And so Jesus didn't send them away. He said, send us into, send us into the pigs, whatever. You, you say, well, why did he send them into pigs? Because there were no cats there that day. You can't herd cats, so if there had been cats there that day, he'd have probably send them into that. But the pigs run down the slope, and they drown. What's that the picture? That's a picture to say what you think is innocent and will never bother you has the ability to destroy you. Now, pig farmer tells me there's more to that than you even imagine because it's impossible to drown a pig. They float. I don't know. I, my daddy never told me that. I was raised on a pig farm. We never saw that. We never tried to sink one of those. I want us to look at some truths today that we need to grasp. Number one, if you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, here's number one. Here's some truths. With Christ in you, you are greater than any evil spirit you are facing. That's a good place to say amen. Say it again. Amen, amen. 1 John 4 and 4. The spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit that lives in the world. So the Spirit, capital S, Jesus, is greater in you than any spirit that you face in the world. So we look at that. And, but we never treat our enemy lightly. I find it really scary when I hear people say, well, the devil's just a bum. He's just a kid. I kick him to the side. He doesn't, he's not, listen, you, you, you don't play this game. Even Michael, the archangel, when he was arguing over uh, verse 9 of Jude says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, he didn't dare be slanderous accusation against the devil. He just said to the devil, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. So I'm going to say, don't get into a casual thing that you just say, well, he's a bum. He's nothing. And you just argue with him. That's not your job. Your job is to stand firm in the power of the name of Jesus. But be sure be sure that Jesus is living in you. Remember in Acts chapter 19, there are these seven sons of Sceva, and they've been seeing the disciples cast out demons. And so they come up to this guy that's demonized, and they said, uh, in, in the name of Jesus and in the name that and Paul who preaches Jesus, I command you to come out. And the, and the, and the demon inside the man says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who in the heck are you? And so the demon jumps on the seven sons, beats them up, tears their clothes off of them, and they run away bleeding and naked as original streakers in the Bible. You ought to read the Bible every once in a while. There's a lot of interesting stories in there. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've got to know that. You've got to believe that. Number two, demons prey on your isolation. Demons prey on your isolation. 1 Peter 5 and 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He, pours, he prowls around like a what? Like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Look at that again. It doesn't say he is a, a lion. Look, there's only one lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's victorious. And the devil tries to mimic everything. He goes around like a roaring lion. You ever see those documentaries uh, on, on TV about how that lions and wolves and all of those hunt their prey? What do they look for? They look for someone who's isolated from the group. They look for someone who's maybe sick, someone who's wandered away, and that's who they attack. Do you think Satan does anything different today? No. He'll try to get you isolated from other believers. He'll try to get you from dropping out. You used to have Christian friends, but now you don't have Christian friends. He's setting you up because he wants to get you in isolation so it's easier to take you down. Not only that, but he'll get you to the place that you say, well, you know, this COVID thing, and we just stay home and watch church. There's not, and if you're sick or you have a deficiency, you need to stay home 
home, you need to do that. But if you're just staying home because it's comfortable, I'm going to tell you what's happening is the enemy is isolating you from the body of Christ and it becomes easier for you to become a prey. He attacks your mind. He attacks your thoughts. He brings more temptations because he wants to isolate you. That's why we say you need to get in a life group. How many of you are in a life group? Raise your hand. Isn't that awesome? That's so great. A life group, and you need to go to growth track every first, second, and third, fourth Sunday at 11 o'clock because it's all about finding a place, finding a place where you fit in the body of Christ. We believe in community here. We are changed lives, changing lives. We are changed lives, changing lives. Mark chapter 5, it said this man was in isolation. He lived in the burial caves. In the latest statistics that comes out about church young people when they graduate from high school and go off to college, the latest statistics are 80% of them drop out of church, and many of them drop out of being a believer altogether. You know why? Why? Because they get, the enemy gets them isolated. And then the professor says, here are facts that God is not real. Here's some facts of what you believe is not true. Here's some facts that we believe that all religions are the same. And so now they're in isolation and they're a prey to the enemy. But you know what? The statistics are uprooted from that by one group of young people. You know who they are? They're young people who served in the church that they left before they went to college because those people that have the heart, those that have been taught to serve, when they go off to college, you know what they do? They never stop looking until they find a church where they can begin serving. Why? Because it's the power of community. It's the power of not being isolated. So listen to me today. If the enemy has been trying to isolate you, you need to get back in Christian relationship and you need to get back in church. Amen. Number three, demons scheme to lure you away from God. They'll study you. They know your weakness. They've been, stu- they've been studying you for years. They know the area where you're most susceptible and the area where he keeps pulling you away. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 says, So stop fooling yourselves. Evil companions will corrupt good morals and characters. People say, oh, I tell you. I'd never fall for a demon. I'd never fall for a demon. No, but you fell for the wrong guy. And the demon says, I don't need to work on her. She's screwing up her own life. I don't need to work on him. He's chasing that girl that doesn't have any love for God. They're already messing up their life. Some people I've met spend what I call a decade of delay. A decade of delay. Why? Dating the wrong person. Inviting the wrong person into their life. Oh, but Pastor Terry, she's so hot. He's so handsome. He's got a lot of abs. And guess what? That goes away. <laughs> but Pastor, he's so rich, he can help us. And, I, and I'll, just, I'll win him to the Lord. And so he'll be able to help the church. Yeah, yeah, he's just so rich. You know what that means? That means when you go through divorce, he can hire more expensive lawyers than you can. Decade of delay. Here's how it's described in the Bible, 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from their true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. In a spiritual warfare, and the demon drops the thought. You don't need to go to church. You don't need that Christian friend. You need this. You don't need to go Sunday. You need to do that. You don't need to go here. Well, that's silly. You can go ahead and do that. You can date that person who says that they're a non-believer. You can live with them. It doesn't matter. So he drops those thoughts. And then people, look at this. They depart from the faith. Why? Because it's the teachings of demons that they've been allowing in their minds and not the power of the word. Number four. Here's another truth we need to look at. Do not give demons a portal or a gateway into your life. You have to give them. The enemy can't take it. The enemy, listen to me, if Jesus is living in your life, the enemy cannot take any territory. He can't take any part in your mind or any of your thoughts unless you give him an opportunity. You ever see those movies, you know, somebody knocks on the door 
and, you, and the person opens the door and they realize it's the enemy that's going to rob them. And what do they do? They try to slam the door. And what does the enemy do? Sticks their foot in the door. That's what the scripture is saying here. Don't give. Look at this scripture. Ephesians. Don't give an opportunity. Don't give an opportunity to the devil. Now, we look at that and we say, well, what does that mean, don't give the devil an opportunity? So, first of all, we think about, well, he's talking about witchcraft, the occult, which is, which is all true. He's talking about a lot of things I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But when I look back, when I was getting ready, I, almost, I had this sermon finished, and God said, go back and look at it in context. Go back and look at it in context and see the portals that I talk about that leads to giving the place the enemy a place in your life even as a believer you say do you believe that a that a believer can be demonized i believe a, a, de, a believer can have anything they want scripture says don't give an opportunity so if a not if a believer wouldn't have an opportunity to be demonized pressured oppressed then he wouldn't say don't give him an opportunity but in context look at this in ephesians chapter 4 verse 37 through 32 Stop lying. Don't get so angry that you sin. Don't give the devil a chance. Quit stealing. Stop all your dirty talk. Stop being bitter and angry and mad at others. Don't yell at one another. Don't curse. The word there is slander each other. Or even be rude, which is insults. Instead, be kind, merciful, and forgive others just as God forgave you because of Christ. These are portals. These are ways that you give an opportunity of the enemy into your life. First of all, he says through lying. Well, why not? Because Satan is a what? A liar and the father of it. That means he's got lots of kids. So if I'm a continual liar, he says you're opening a portal or a gateway for the enemy to have more influence in your life. Or anger, uncontrolled, constant anger, sinful anger. You ever met somebody like that? A believer. Always mad. Always angry. Always doing that. Why? Because they've allowed the enemy in that area. They've never dealt with that. They haven't been to freedom, which you'll learn more in the fall. Or they haven't been to celebrate recovery, which happens every Monday night that you need to be here. Anger. Anger. Christians were never meant to just blow off like that. If that happens, then you've got to realize that there's a possibility that you've opened a portal where the enemy has a, a little foothold into your life. And then he talks about stealing. Well, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy, right? People say, I would never steal. Well, do you give God the full tithe? Filthy speech. He's not talking about not being humorous. God loves a little laughter. But what he's talking about here is that you just, you're just a filthy talker. And you talk so much like that, you don't even realize what you're doing. But he says you're, you're giving an opportunity, an open portal for more satanic influence in your life. And then he says an unforgiving spirit. If you harbor bitterness and anger in your heart towards someone, your heart is giving the enemy an opportunity. Slander. The Greek word here for devil is diabolos, or the Greek word for devil is diabolos, which means slander or accuser. When you share gossip or slander, you're doing the devil's work. Proverbs 25, 18, lying about and slandering people are as bad as hitting them with a club or wounding them with an arrow or stabbing them with a sword. So we don't flirt with darkness, right? We don't give a door there, but we also don't flirt with other things like seances, tarot cards, Ouija boards. Parents, I hope you're teaching your kids that there are things that you stay away from. It opens a door. We don't even read horoscopes. Why? Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy 18 and 10, do not let your people practice fortune telling, use sorcery, interpret omens, Ouija boards, engage in witchcraft, cast spells, or any functions of mediums or psychics. Don't call Beth at 1-800-222. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. We have become immune in America to demonic movies. 
Now, if you want to watch a scary movie, watch a stupid scary movie, all right? But be careful when you get into these blood and gore, demon. And listen, parents, be careful that you don't allow your kids to sit night and day in front of these games that are shooting, cutting heads off, blood and gore. It's an opportunity for the enemy to come in. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm saying, you say, oh, that's just silly. That's just fun. Let me talk to you 10 years down the road. You say, well, you're an old fuddy-duddy. No, I'm talking about, thank God for parents who learn to put down the law and say, no, we don't do that in my house. We don't watch movies like that. We don't listen to movies like that. We don't read books like that. You know, after they did the poltergeist movies, it's interesting. You go online, you find that there were some real strange deaths to the leading actors after that filming. Hmm. You see, you learn all of this through the classroom or you learn it through the laboratory. I want to learn it through the classroom like sitting here today. Let me give you an, uh, 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 an illustration. Years ago, I was in Greece, Athens, Greece, and I was there with a mission team. And uh, we were at a church, and during the, during the days, we'd get on a bus and we'd go different places and we would do different mission work. And there's a young girl there by the name of Marika. Marika swam with the uh, Greek uh, Olympic team. Very beautiful young lady. But when she'd get on the bus with us, she just liked to hang around everybody. So she'd get on the bus with us, and she'd sit in the back. And the whole time we were going somewhere, she would, she would always read books about the occult and satanic worship. And every time she would do that. And then she would come to the night services. And then she would be uh, uh, very alert, laughing with everybody. But when I would start to teach, she would fall asleep every night. Just boom, boom, boom. Just fall asleep. On the last night that we were there, uh, she was out in the, in, the, in, the, in the lobby after the service. And I went up to her and I said, Marika, I want you to know you've been hanging around us all week. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you very much. And he's got a great purpose for your life. She said, no, no, I, I don't believe it. I said, Marika, Jesus loves you. He's got a great purpose for your life. And she said, no, that's not true. I said, yeah, it is true. God loves you so much. And then all of a sudden her voice changed. Her voice changed from a lady's voice to a very low manly voice. That's a lie. She's mine. And I will never give her up. Dude, what an opportunity. I said, you're a liar. And I claim her in Jesus' name. We were on the second story, and she took off running towards plate glass windows to run straight through those windows to maybe her death down below. And some of the ladies there grabbed her and restrained her. And we began praying for her. And you know what? Her head never spun around once. <laughs> she never vomited six feet out once. Now, she was very vile. The words came out of her mouth. I've never heard anybody use words like she did. And when somebody held, one of the kids held up a little New Testament behind her head. Not that she couldn't, no way she could see that. But just the fact of that New Testament there, she turned around and tried to spit on the word of God. But you know what? The demons had to leave. Why? Because the name of Jesus is more powerful than any demon force that there ever is. And so you say, well, what did you do after that? We went to dinner. If you suspect that you've allowed an entry point into your home or your kids have, then I would encourage you this week to go by room by room and take authority over anything that's there. Also, I would recommend that if you've recently purchased or went on a trip and brought something back from you from a foreign country, and, and you have no idea what it was, but it was just kind of cute. But what you don't know is in many of those countries where I was, that a lot of those artifacts and a lot of those objects that they sell to, especially Christians, have been dedicated to the, back, to the dark forces. And so you bring that into your home and you say, I don't know, but ever since we put that picture on the wall, ever since we put that little statue there, we've had really strange occurrences in our house and I don't know where they're coming from. And guess what? We've helped a lot of people say, you know what? You need to take that down. Oh yeah, but we paid $500 for that. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, we just take it down to Goodwill and sell it. Go ahead, let it bother somebody else. No, you know what you do? You take a hammer, you break that, you burn that. You don't want to give any opportunity into your life. In Acts chapter 19, when Paul and them were preaching and they're casting out demons, it said the people that practiced witchcraft brought their books, brought everything they had, they piled it up and they burned it. And the price of that was about 50,000 coins. I'm going to tell you, it's time to wake up, make sure you know what's in your your house. So you go into a room. You say, well, how do you do it, Terry? Would you come and do it? No, it's your house. You allowed it in. Now you have the authority to take it back. Because if I came in and did it, it'd be me and not you. Give no opportunity to the enemy. You say, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? Well, you just walk in and you simply say, in the name of Jesus, I command any Anything in here that's not of the Lord, any devil, any demon, any dark spirit, I command you to get out right now. Get out in the name of Jesus and by the power of the blood. And guess what? They have to go. Say, what if they don't go? They have to go. Did you hear what I'm saying? They have to go. They have to go. Number five, we don't fight with our own power, but we fight with God's authority. We never fight in our own power. Matthew 10 and 1, Jesus gathered his 12 disciples. He imparted to them authority to cast out demons and heal every sickness and every disease. So why do we say, yes, we believe in healing, we believe in casting out and healing diseases, but we give no emphasis to demonic spirits? Because the enemy doesn't want us to. We're too sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Jesus gave, Jesus didn't give, listen to me. Jesus didn't give his disciples his power. Jesus gave, gave his disciples the authority to use his power. Because you see, if it's in my power, I, don't, I could go out here and stand in the middle of the road and stand out just like I am right now and hold my hand up, you know, and, and people say, what's that crazy guy doing? Who is he? And they'd call the officer out front on duty and say, you better move that guy. He's out there trying to stop traffic. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I want to stop the traffic. But let me put a uniform on and a badge. I can step out there the same way. Don't even have to hold a yellow sign or anything. Just stand out there and in the uniform with a badge, hold my hand and people stop. Why? Same person. Why? Because they recognize there's authority in who they are. Listen, when you begin to stand up in the authority of who you are in Jesus, the enemy has to flee. He has to flee. Listen, here's what the Bible says. Look at this. James 4, 7, and 8. Read it with me. Therefore, submit to God. Stop right there. That's the problem where some of you are right now. You're not fully submitted to God. You're partially, partially. You come to church if you feel like it. You get involved and volunteer if you feel like it. You pray if you feel like it. You're not committed. You know what a committed person does? A committed person that's fully submitted to something does it whether they feel like it or not. A couple of days a week, I go with a horrible trainer from hell. And I don't feel like it. And I walk in and he says, get in there, warm up, do the treadmill. And I come out and he says, do this, do that, do this. I say, I don't want to. He says, I don't care, do it. Because I want the results. If I want the results of living victoriously, the first place I start is not yelling at the devil, not trying to put on a show, but submit to God. If I submit to God and then I resist the devil, what does it say? He will flee. If I submit to God and I resist the devil, what does it say? He has to flee. So I say, well, I submit to God. Okay, God, just take care of my life. No, he says, submit to God, resist the devil. No, we're not watching that in our home. We're not playing that. I'm not going to entertain that thought. No, I'm not going there. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to do that. Submit to God, resist the devil, and what? He has to flee. He has to flee. He has, he has no choice. He has to, that's the word. Is that the word? Is that the word? You're going to stand on the word? I stand on that word. Resist the devil, and he has to flee. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, Satan has no right no place in our lives as believers. We're going to draw near to God and we're going to win the battle. Father, I thank you today that we don't fight for victory. 
we fight from a position of victory. Right there with your head bowed, would you ask the Lord right now? Would you ask the Lord right now to give you strength for any attack that's coming against you? There's some of you that would say, you know what? I really felt like lately I've been under attack. I couldn't explain it, but what today, what you talked about, I really realized I've been under an attack from the enemy. Would you pray for me, Terry? Would you pray for me? Yes, I will. Listen, I want to pray for you right now, but I want you to see yourself as Jesus sees you, victorious. Submit yourself to God. If you need to repent of something, repent of that today. Submit yourself to God. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are all-powerful. You're the all-knowing, and you're the God that is ever-present. God, we thank you, and as we pray today, Lord, we ask you to release your angels to battle on our behalf. God, I pray for everyone that's here today or watching online that feels under attack. God, I ask you to give them victory, help them to put on the helmet of salvation, put on the breastplate of righteousness, put on the shield of faith, the belt of truth, and the shoes prepared for the gospel of peace, and that they would have the sword of the Lord, the word of God, and they would pray in the spirit on all all occasions. God, I pray and thank you that as we pray today, Lord, that you will act on behalf of your children. And God, we thank you today for your son, Jesus Christ. As you continue to battle today, I know there's some of you who say, you know what? I really do feel like I'm in a battle today, Terry. I feel like I'm being drawn to the Lord somehow. But even in the midst of that, I feel like there's something else speaking to me and say, oh no, that's not for you. That's stupid. Don't buy into that religious stuff. You don't need Jesus. And you're in that battle this morning. I want you to know today how much that God loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, born without sin, to live a perfect life. And he went to the cross and he shed his blood for your sins. And on the third day, he arose and he ascended in heaven. And he's seated right now at the hand of the Father. And he's praying for you. He's praying for you. The bottom line is you have a choice. He said, I feel like I'm drawn to God, but I feel like something's pushing me away. You have a choice. You have a choice who wins this battle today, either God or Satan. Who gets your life, God or Satan? Some of you right now are going to say, today's the day. Jesus, I want to believe in you, that you are the Son of God, that you're my Savior. I surrender my life to you. If that's your prayer today, you say, Terry, that's that's who I am today. I need to surrender to Jesus. I need to rededicate my life to him. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now, make eye contact with me and say, that's me. I need to pray that prayer today. Thank you. Others today, thank you, thank you, thank you today. Those of you that are watching online, just raise your hand. Say, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. Listen, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I can give you the words, but you have to surrender the heart. And then after I do that, before you leave today, our prayer team is going to come down front. They're going to be standing down here because somebody may say, you know, something came up in my heart and I I really need somebody to agree with me in prayer about that. And so they're going to be down here for you to pray. But before they do that, I want you to join me in prayer right now. Say, thank you, God, for loving me, for sending your son, Jesus to die for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come in my life. I submit myself to you wholeheartedly and I resist the enemy today and he has to flee. I'm walking out of here with peace today. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap for those who prayed that prayer?